We're just having looked at the nuclear industry in the past. I mean, you have to pay for safety. Presumably, you have to pay for environmental safety as well. So in a way, one has to expect that if we demand more, we pay more, and that's part of the cost we pay, and that poses greater burdens on developing countries um, who maybe not, don't have the resources. But uh, part of me sort of thinks that's got to be a, a, a given in a way that if we do as a society expect that there's greater standards, greater safeties, we have to accept that we pay for it. I'd be interested to hear from Gabriel on this because I know Gabriel wants to come in. Just, yeah. I don't think I made myself clear and come back to that. I think the, the, what I see in the developing world now is from the rich countries, a lot of this sort of small is beautiful, solar is good, wind's good, all of these. These often cost four or five times the cost of, uh, of hydropower. And I think that there's a very serious burden on the industries who are pushing these and places like the World Bank to look at this hard, not to say, oh, green, we don't need to check that, we don't need to test it, it's good. No, it sometimes will be, but sometimes will not be. And so I think it has to be subject to the same test and the criteria have to be consistent. And Gabriel, you were keen to come in. Yeah, uh, related to that, I, I, you know, I want to come back to the, the point of, of corruption, then I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll leap into what John has just said. And, and, and just to agree with uh, Minister Prabhu and, and Minister Mutagamba, uh, we've uh, put forward here in this panel a, a few myths that really are not supported by any reality, at least for those of us who have actually been involved in infrastructure development. One is the issue that was brought forward earlier on cost overruns being associated with hydropower. Cost overruns are associated to any types of infrastructure development, and either because you know, we make mistakes or because we have the courage and the boldness to develop things, to actually build things that are positive for development. So it comes with the territory. But the second myth is that, uh, and, and, and for that I would like to say that big is actually better, is to associate corruption with hydropower. Uh, corruption, as Minister Prabhu said very well, is associated to anything. And, and in, in our business of hydropower development, what actually uh, large corporations want, you know, responsible corporations want, is a level playing field. The more transparent the playing field, the better it is for those who believe can compete at a world-class level with anyone. Uh, and for, for, for those kinds of opportunities, really, you want to bring exposure, you want scrutiny, you want the press to be involved, you want the World Bank to be looking at these things, and, and, and you want to bring the better minds. And to bring the better minds, to bring the human resources that Minister Prabhu talked about, you have to have projects that are challenging. Do you think that I could go to Harvard and ask John Briscoe to help me if I was to build a PCH, a mini hydro in the back uh, lands of Ceará? Probably not. not. Or even Zachary, if I were to, to seek the help of a, a large NGO, as I have had in the past. Now, if the project is challenging, offers an opportunity to do good things and to challenge ourselves as developers, as environmentalists, as social scientists, as politicians, you could probably attract the better minds, the best people. Uh, and finally, I want to change the thing around. When we talked about the World Bank standards and, and, and the governance issue that John talked about that I agree with, I think it is an issue of governance and it's partly or to a large extent, uh, your responsibility at the Financial Times and at the Washington Post. I work at the bank for many, many years, and I think the standards are not too rigorous. We use them voluntarily in many of our projects. Other companies do, other governments do. And, and I really never had a difficulty when I was in the bank to show to a manager that the project was meeting the technical requirements of the safeguards. But their greatest fear was to have their project or their name associated with some kind of a disaster in the front page of the Financial Times. So they had never had the courage to go beyond, or very seldom had the courage, to go beyond that threshold. And the same thing with our friends here at, at, at the NGO movement. I was part of the NGO movement. I was with WWF for a while. I was a vice president at WWF. Uh, many, many times I've taken people to projects uh, from, from, uh, uh, from NGO communities, to projects in which they have actually supported us and given us very good and, and, and interesting advice that made our projects better. 
but they have asked us not to document that. Yeah. Because if it goes on the newspaper, their governance, their funding is going to go short. So there is also a, a, that side. That's, so I'd like to hear your views on that. That's a very, no, that is a very good issue. There is the question of there are lots of vested interests in this debate. It's a debate that's more important because of climate change. And the vested interests, as much as they may be private operators, can also be the NGOs. Martin, you were keen to have a word. Yeah, I wanted to say still something on the Brazilian energy, just, just briefly as a response. I think for, for Brazil, we as WWF, we did a kind of an energy vision or climate solutions report for Brazil. And in fact, I think the outcome of that, that was that biofuels or there are other opportunities for Brazil to come up with its energy solutions and not necessary large-scale hydro. So I, I think we, we, have, we might have a different view on that. So I'm <clears throat> it's the question is also how seriously these kind of energy visions for countries are prepared and also looking into a regional context. And there might be also some disagreement on that. Getting back to another element on the irrigation or on agriculture, I think again, similar to the kind of energy side, hydro energy side, I think that there are also opportunities in terms of efficiency, leakages in the system uh, and other crops which you foot should first kind of apply and kind of skim and filter your kind of demand before you actually then conceive your, your, your kind of storage needs from an agricultural or from a food production perspective and biofuels production perspective. And for, for flood, flood management, we, we brought out a report on living with the floods on the Mekong and in other areas we have also some kind of similar views that if, if, of course, if you build in the middle of the floodplain and risk areas like in Istanbul, just after the last World Water Forum, there was a, a kind of a, a quarter of a city just swept away. Um, of course, if you build there, then you need to have protection and you build storage. But if you keep that from with kind of your city planning, Mexico was the same, uh, Mexico City, if you keep that kind of those areas free or you, you, you develop kind of insurance system for people who are urgently need to settle there or don't provide them with insurance. But th there are other solutions out there which you need to kind of think through uh, and other measures and, and kind of solutions before you enter into the, the, the determining your storage needs. So, and that goes for every single kind of of these multi-purpose services you expect from storage. And if you haven't, haven't done that properly, you end up with individual site planning, which might be out of context, and you end up having a kind of a long-term investments out there and probably not serving your purpose at the end. And Rachel, I think you wanted to come in on this. Well, I, I, wanted, I wanted to come in on standards because <clears throat> they, become, they become sort of everybody's litmus test. And, you know, we can sit here and say, oh, we all support, you know, large-scale infrastructure, but then it always comes down to project X, you know, oh no, we, we support, all, but we don't support that project, or we don't support that one. There is no denying that across the World Bank Group, on the private side and on the public side, our standards are the better for having been chased by NGOs over the course of the last 20 to 30 years, and being forced to look up to issues that perhaps weren't in the mindset of management. There's no question of that. And we, we are better as an institution for our own transparency and for the dialogue that we have on a continual basis with civil society, with the private sector, with everybody. But st standards are just one piece of a risk management process. And what's different is I think that different stakeholders sitting in very different parts of the world with different world views have different risk appetites. And the question is whose risk appetite really matters? And so, unfortunately, for sta standards have become a zero-sum game around compliance. And it's not about compliance. It's about a dialogue between a developer, the country, local government, national government, stakeholders, local, national, regional, and international. I mean, we live, in a, we live in, a, in a wired world. And that conversation around concept, design, planning, whatever, and then a continual conversation through the years of building and then through operation and then through operation and maintenance. And that doesn't sit very well with a zero-sum gain compliance mindset. Mm -hmm. And so the question that I think that, you know, we've learned a lot about how to improve the consultation process, how to improve now. It's, e it's not even a consultation. It's a continual dialogue between a piece of infrastructure, a community, and a country that have got to live together for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. So I think we've learned a lot about how to stimulate that kind of debate, how to build capacity within the company often, 
the constructing, construction company, the operator, but also with the local government, government and community about how to have that conversation. But guess what? At a certain time, the conversation is going to make its own set of decisions around its own risk appetite. And, you know, maybe us in the bank, maybe some of our board members, maybe an NGO sitting, you know, in London or Berkeley or wherever, you know, is outside of that consensus around the risk appetite. And at that point, you know, who decides? And that's the, the governance issue. So I, I think that, uh, I think we try to shoehorn these kinds of projects which are more transparent than almost any other project you could possibly think of into, into a checkbox system, and that doesn't work. Brilliant, thank you. Rachel, I, I think, Jean, you're quite keen to come in here. Let me, let me make a, maybe it's a provocative point. Go on. If you think about the Millennium Development Goals, they're really about social well-being, you know, access to water, uh, uh, education, etc. It's not about uh, poverty reduction or economic development. And to a certain extent, the World Commission's on Dams report and the MDGs drove the international donor organizations to a different direction. So they stopped building dams. Let me, let me offer a proposition. Wouldn't you rather have the ADB and the African Development Bank and the World Bank and USAID properly manage and organize dam building using the regulations and all of the best principles for uh, ecological flows and everything else than having what you have now, which is a lot of countries are self-financing their own dams, dam construction, and not really following any of the sort of accepted uh, principles for, for integrated water resources management. Thank you. And oh, hang on, Zach, because there were other people just before you. And then I think, John, you wanted to come in on this one, did you? Oh, well, then I'll take Zach on this point then. So that question was to me. Yeah? No. Me, oh. no just general. In general. Um, so more to the NGOs, certainly. Okay. Um, so uh, let me get back to the discussion about uh, corruption and governance, which I think helps to answer your question a bit. I think, uh, um, well, uh, International Rivers uh, uh, certainly thinks that, of course, corruption is not limited to dams. There's no question about that. Corruption, uh, and getting back to Gabriel's uh, uh, evocation of, of the myths, uh, that pervade in, in uh, development finance, uh, certainly corruption is everywhere. Corruption is an institutional question. It's not a sectoral question. I think we're all in agreement about that. And so should we then uh, uh, say, uh, well, the new financiers, China, Brazil, India, and so forth, are going to include large hydro as uh, one of their options just because, and so let's hang on tight. And I, I don't think that's the approach that Rachel is saying. I think uh, you're saying that the World Bank needs to be involved there. So on that aspect, yes, the World Bank needs to be involved precisely because Rachel uh, has admitted that it's through the articulation, decades worth of articulation with civil society, that precisely the standards uh, uh, at uh, the, the bank uh, group are so high. And it's precisely because of our constant communication with the IFC that the recent performance standards do have good language. What uh, International Rivers and, and colleagues, I think, around the world, not just in the United States and Europe, would rather see is uh, improvement of country systems. And I know for, for a fact that the bank is interested in this uh, with the new program for results tool. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think we're, we're at somewhat of a, a midpoint where the bank used to be the traditional financier of large dams. Now we have the growth of China, the growth of Brazil, the growth of India, uh, but yet those institutions are not up to par. And I think that that, that is not such a provocative statement. And, and I would challenge Gabriel to look at inside of Brazilian institutions, even in Benedesi, um, when, when Gabriel says, well, in, in uh, the Brazilian planning sector, uh, we voluntarily take into account certain standards, I think that that's not enough. I think that civil society, uh, civil society's uh, capacity to engage with institutions in Brazil is not as good as it should be. And so I'd, I'd argue that to get to a place where you're enjoying the same sort of relationship as civil society has had with the bank group uh, and be able to implement, because it's, it's, it's a question of implementation of standards on the ground. Uh, uh, high standards, then you need to improve the country systems first. And so I'd, I'd just throw that flag of caution out there. 
Now, I'm going to have this, it's fascinating. I'm, I've got three people who very much want to speak. We have to keep it very short. If we want time to take a question from the floor and then finish up because we're coming towards the end. So if I do it in order of people who've raised their fingers, I'll ask Martin first. Just to your question you asked on uh, whether we'd rather have uh, kind of institutions like World Bank, ADB or others kind of being uh, involved and, uh, and, and being up to the high standards. I think the ELISO example was an interesting one where export credit agencies kind of were then at the end, they were very carefully screening. They were put under pressure by uh, International Rivers, by, ex by uh, ECA Watch and others. And <clears throat> But at the end of the day, it was the Turkish government failing to kind of fulfill the conditions set forth by the export credit agencies, and, and they stepped out of it. Uh, the question now is whether those who are, whether self-financing by Turkey or eventually other financial institutions stepping in, I think, yes, there's a risk, um, but I think they're also in emerging markets or in China, uh, as an example, they have a new green landing policy just recently published. So I think the, 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 the standards will also in, in, in some of the other countries which we, we, we were, were kind of suspecting that they undermine standards, I think they will also kind of be higher in future. And therefore, I, I see that it's not only, not only ADB, World Bank, and, and African Development Bank. I think if, if, if commonly agreed standards are out there, I think then we, 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 will, we will move forward. And I'd offer now the floor to Minister Mitagamba, who will have to leave soon. Thank you very much. I really want to appreciate the issue of standards being set and being observed, but of course, definitely these standards have got to be classified too. Definitely, we don't expect the standards set for Brazil or China to apply to Kenya, Tanzania, or Ethiopia because of the capabilities of applying. Secondly, the, the issue of alternative source of energy, which is very good, and but I know that Almost all developed countries, their baseline, their original development started with the hydropower. Then they moved into other alternatives. Having built capacity, and even now talking about solar, talking about wind power, it's because they had built capacity which brought them to now look at the alternative. The African continent, the developing world, still needs to build capacity. And that's why we think we may not develop the mega uh, hydropower projects like the Three Gorges or the Hoover Dam or whatever, but we need those dams to build our capacity to take off. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. And Minister Prabhu. Yeah, you know, it looks like that uh, we use the same point and come out with a different argument. So I was just thinking, like, for example, say, let's take the example of flood. You know, flood is something which is ecologically a desirable phenomena because if there are no floods, probably it will not be able to replenish the good, fertile soil that flood water brings in. But the type of damage it causes is also phenomenal, which therefore we really need moderation, control of flood in a proper manner. Now I was just wondering whether, when we do so much of studies, has Martin or somebody done a study of, for a large country, wherein we can say that without doing anything, you know, we have all the solutions available to us, efficiency, leakage is dropping, and it can still meet with energy needs, food need, the water needs, drinking water, energy. Can we come out with a study like this for a world country, big country, and then we can actually use that into reality? Then probably there is no need for it. But in the absence of it, it always leads to some sort of a confusion. So can an organization like yours take up a responsibility to say that we like to prepare a complete end-to-end -end solution for a large country, wherein with existing infrastructure we can meet all the needs? Has some study been made or something like this that will be really help to solve this problem? 